Hello everybody, before we get into today's video, I've got a quick, exciting announcement. I've partnered with Omaze to give you guys the chance to win a Tesla Model S and $20,000. Taxes and shipping are included for US residents. Even better, every donation benefits two great causes, Give Power and 501c3. All you have to do is go to omaze.com forward slash biographics and enter for your chance to win. Now, of course, it's nice to give money to charity, but hey, you can also win a Tesla. What more do I need to say? This is, without doubt, one of the coolest promotions we've done on this channel. So, if you think that you'd look cool riding around in a new Tesla, well, good news, enter below. In all seriousness, this is a pair of great causes that you can support. So, if that sounds good to you, go enter for your chance to win a Tesla Model S and $20,000 at amaze.com forward slash biographics. And like I said, every donation supports two great charities. It's a win-win, and let's get into the video. Before Marilyn Monroe and Jane Mansfield, there was Jean Harlow. She was one of Hollywood's earliest sex symbols, whose image revolved around her luscious curls with a unique color that earned her the moniker the Platinum Blonde. It made her the envy of women all across the nation who tried and failed to achieve the same locks of hair. Her look brought her success, but it came with a heavy price, as the same beauty regimen that transformed Jean Harlow into a household name was also slowly but surely poisoning her. Inevitably, Harlow fell into one of the many pitfalls of Hollywood and died at a young age after a prolonged suffering. She became a cautionary tale, another one of Tinseltown's tragic stories in an industry that is filled with them. Even so, Jean Harlow's legacy goes beyond the mistakes and vices she accumulated in her pursuit of fame and fortune, and today we will examine it close up as we take a look at the life and career of Jean Harlow, the original blonde bombshell. Jean Harlow was born Harleen Carpenter on the 3rd of March 1911 in Kansas City, Missouri. She was born into a wealthy but unhappy family. Her father, Montclair Carpenter, was a dentist with a thriving practice, while her mother, Jean Poe Carpenter, was the daughter of a successful real estate agent named Samuel Harlow. Later, when Jean Harlow became a star using her mother's maiden name, Jean Poe Carpenter went by Mother Jean in order to set herself apart, but we're going to call her that from the beginning just to avoid any confusion. Young Harleen spent the first 10 years of her life in Kansas City enrolling at Ms. Barstow's finishing school for girls when she was five. In 1921, however, Mother Jean divorced her husband and won sole custody of Harleen and promptly left Missouri. In her early 30s, Mother Jean still saw herself as young and beautiful, and she had dreamt of becoming an actress ever since she was a child. She took her daughter and traveled to Los Angeles, hoping to make it big, but soon found out just how cruel Hollywood could be. Although she was young, she was not movie star young, as studios were only interested in women in their early 20s or younger, so the mother and daughter relocated again, this time to Illinois. In Chicago, Mother Jean married her second husband, a man named Marino Bello. As for Harleen, she fell in love with a boy a few years older than her named Charles Chuck McGrew. Their relationship soon turned serious, and the couple eloped in September 1927 when Harleen was 16 years old. Charles McGrew was a trust fund baby, and once he turned 21, he received his first check. The young couple were now wealthy. They didn't need to work, so instead they moved to Los Angeles and bought a nice house in Beverly Hills, where they quickly developed a reputation for being a party couple who often hosted luncheons, barbecues, and other social gatherings. At this time, Harleen still had no grand ambitions about becoming an actress. Her foray into Hollywood was mostly happenstance. During her parties, she befriended an aspiring actress named Rosalie Roy, and one day she gave Rosalie a ride to the Fox Studios lot for an audition. While waiting, Harleen was approached by a few studio execs who immediately noticed the young, beautiful blonde and were very surprised to find out that she wasn't an actress. Even so, they told her that she had the look for it, and they gave her a letter of introduction for central casting in case she wanted to try her hand at doing some work as an extra. Initially, she had no intention of going there, but was goaded into doing it by Rosalie. When she signed up, she didn't want to use her real name, so instead she wrote down her mother's maiden name, Jean Harlow. Speaking of Mother Jean, although her daughter had eloped and moved to another city, the two of them were still close. When she found out about Jean being discovered by movie execs, she realized that she could live a Hollywood fantasy vicariously through her daughter. She also encouraged Jean to accept work as an extra, eventually moving to Los Angeles herself in order to manage her daughter's burgeoning career. In 1928, Jean Harlow appeared in her first movie as an uncredited extra, a drama by Alfred E. Green titled On a Bound. A few more bit parts followed, and they were enough to impress the executives Hal Roach Studios, who offered Jean a contract. In 1929, she started having small roles in some of the studio's main moneymakers, including comedy shorts starring Charlie Chase and Lauren Hardy. 
In the movie Bacon Grabbers, Jean even received her first co-starring credit as Mrs. Kennedy after previously only appearing in unnamed or uncredited roles. It seems like Jean Harlow's star was on the rise, but things were not going well at home. Her husband, Chuck McGrew, was not thrilled with his wife's new career and he wanted her to quit acting. She actually relented at first and pleaded with the studio to release her from a contract. They agreed to do this around the time that Jean turned 18 years old, but just a few months later, she left her husband anyway. Presumably, this was the work of Mother Jean, who persuaded her daughter to choose a career in Hollywood over a marriage. Soon after leaving McGrew, Jean Harlow began appearing in movies again. Her first speaking role came in the 1929 Clara Bow feature, The Saturday Night Kid, and her big break was just around the corner. This period represented a turning point for Hollywood thanks to the arrival of sound. Oh yes, they have an audience movement. Silent films were slowly being faded out in favor of talkies, and many actors of the silent era also found their careers waning as directors and movie producers felt that their voices did not have the same star quality that matched their looks. One actor in the situation was Greta Nissen. Born and raised in Norway, she had a heavy Nordic accent, which up until that point had not been a problem. However, in 1928, she signed on to star in Howard Hughes' epic war film, Hell's Angels. This was an incredibly ambitious and expensive production for the time, one that employed 20,000 extras and used over 2.2 million feet of film. As a successful entrepreneur and pioneering aviator himself, Howard Hughes was nothing if not a risk taker, so he wanted to incorporate all the latest filming techniques available at the time. Almost half of the film was shown in tinted colors, while one particular scene in a ballroom used an even more advanced two-color technicolor process. Then, in 1929, even though filming was mostly finished, Hughes decided that he wanted to transform Hell's Angels from a silent film into a talkie and reshoot all of the scenes with dialogue. This created a problem with the leading lady. As we mentioned, Greta Nissen had a thick Norwegian accent, but she was supposed to portray a British aristocrat. Eventually, Hughes dismissed her from the role, and the search began for a new actress. How exactly Hughes found out about Jean Harlow remains uncertain, although most stories say that it was his leading man, Ben Leon, who suggested her for the role. Hughes gave her the part, and Jean Harlow was now finally set on her path to stardom. Hell's Angels premiered on May 27, 1930 at Grauman's Chinese Theatre in Hollywood. It was a hit, and it received praise from everyone for its flying scenes, but Harlow's acting didn't really win anyone over. One newspaper even described her as plain awful. This was not a particular surprise. She was still only 18 when she shot her scenes and never had any formal training. Even so, it wasn't her acting prowess that lured in the audience. This was pre-code Hollywood, and movies still had plenty of sexual content, as evidenced by the promotional photograph used to market the movie featuring Harlow and Ben Leon. Even the poster for the movie gave the unknown Jean Harlow top billing as Hughes knew that a sexy, seductive starlet would attract more attention. At the very least, Harlow's role allowed her to immortalize herself in the annals of cinema with a memorable line that has been adapted and repeated countless times, although most people probably don't know where it originally came from when she asks one of her male co-leads, Would you be shocked if I put on something more comfortable? Despite the success of Hell's Angels, Howard Hughes had no immediate plans to use Jean Harlow in another movie, so he loaned her out to other studios to keep her in the spotlight. Back then, during the studio system days, actors could not cherry-pick only the roles they wanted to. They usually signed a long-term contract with a specific movie studio in exchange for a weekly salary, and the execs decided what films they would make. 1931 was a great year for Harlow as she starred in popular movies such as The Secret Six with Clark Gable and The Public Enemy with James Cagney. Meanwhile, Hughes put the might of his marketing department behind behind Harlow, intending to turn her into a household name. Rival studio Paramount had Clara Bow, who was known as the It Girl. United Artists had Mary Pickford, aka America's Sweetheart, and Hughes decided that Harlow also needed a moniker. Some ideas, such as the blonde landslide and the darling cyclone, were dismissed. Allegedly, it was Hughes's publicity director who came up with the winning answer, the platinum. Blonde. After all, it was Harlow's stunning golden locks that immediately drew the attention of the viewer, much more than her acting. Hughes even launched a national contest, offering a prize of $10,000 to any stylist who could match the color of her hair. Nobody ever claimed the money, although this might be because no other stylist would have thought to subject their clients to the kind of treatment that Harlow was receiving, but more on that later. The point is that the name was a hit with the public, and one of Harlow's movies from 1931 even had its title changed to Platinum Blonde to fully capitalize on the popularity of the nickname. Harlow's other well-known moniker came in 1933, when she starred in the screwball comedy Bombshell. From then on, she became known as the Blonde Bombshell, and in 1942 the word Bombshell was amended in the Oxford English Dictionary to include the meaning of a pretty woman of startling vitality or physique. Although her career was flourishing, Harlow's personal life was not doing so well. While working on Hell's Angels, she met producer Paul Byrne, who turned into one of her biggest supporters backstage. The
The two first became friends, then started dating, and finally married in July of 1932. Just two months later, Vern was found dead of a gunshot wound in his house, and the exact circumstances behind his death are still a mystery to this day. Officially, it was quickly ruled a suicide since there was a note left behind which said, Dearest dear, unfortunately, this is the only way to make good the frightful wrong I have done you and to wipe out my abject humiliation. I love you, Paul. You understand that last night was only a comedy. However, decades later, the investigation was criticized for being haphazard and whitewashed and tainted by studio interference, which was done in order to protect Gene Harlow's image rather than to find the truth behind Paul Byrne's death. Later authors even claimed that the studio execs, led by Louis B. Mayer, were the first on the scene before the police and that the officers were okay with this since many of them were being paid off by studio fixers in order to look the other way when it came to crimes that might tarnish the reputations of the stars. Allegedly, Mayer even wanted to destroy the note but was persuaded to leave it so that Byrne's death looked like a suicide caused by his inability to fulfill his marital obligations, aka impotence. For all we know, this could have been the truth, but it's impossible to tell since the execs could have altered the crime scene in other ways that we don't know about. One theory that has gained attention over the last decades pointed the finger at a woman named Dorothy Millette, Byrne's former common-law wife. Technically, the two were still married, although Byrne left her when she checked herself into a sanitarium. Once she was out, Byrne started corresponding with her and sent her money every month. Millette committed suicide just a few days after Byrne's death and rumors started appearing that she may have been involved somehow. These were never substantiated, but the tale of the scorned former lover was just too obvious a scenario to ignore. As for Jean Harlow, she was not home when Byrne died. During the investigation, she only said that she knew nothing and refused to discuss the matter in public for the rest of her life, most likely at the insistence of the studio. Even though Howard Hughes invested heavily in promoting Jean Harlow as the platinum blonde, he sold her contract in 1932 to MGM. This was when Paul Byrne was still alive, as he was an executive at MGM and persuaded the higher-ups that she'd make a good investment. Jean Harlow's first movie with MGM was called Red-Headed Woman, a comedy that received critical acclaim and was one of the few roles that garnered Harlow praise for her acting. It also had a lot of risque content for that time, such as affairs, premarital sex, and attempted murder, but the most surprising thing about it was that the actress didn't make you Use of her signature platinum blonde curls, since, as the title implies, the lead character was a redhead. Although her character dyes her hair in the first scene of the movie, in real life, Jean Harlow wore a wig. Afterwards, the actress returned to her trademark look in a string of movies with varying degrees of success. The hits included the aforementioned Bombshell and the romantic dramas Red Dust and Hold Your Man, where she starred alongside Clark Gable, her most frequent on-screen partner. Harlow could not find the same success in her personal life, though. In 1933 came the third husband, a cinematographer named Hal Rawson, who had previously worked with the actress on several movies. It had often been reported that this marriage had been arranged by MGM to protect Harlow's reputation. Prior to her relationship with Rawson, she had been engaged in a romantic tryst with boxer Max Baer, who at the time was separated but not divorced from his wife, actress Dorothy Dunbar. Not only was this affair pretty well known in Hollywood, but Dunbar also threatened to name Jean Harlow in her divorce proceedings for engaging in adultery with her husband. Eventually, the studio stepped in and insisted not only that Harlow enter a fling with Bear, but that she enter into a more appropriate relationship for the sake of her public image. Unsurprisingly, her marriage with Rawson was short and loveless. A few weeks after the wedding, Harlow was rushed to the hospital for an emergency appendectomy. Afterwards, instead of returning home, the actress moved in with Mother Jean during her convalescence. She quietly divorced Rawson about seven months later. This was Harlow's last marriage, although she soon entered into a long-term relationship with actor William Powell that lasted until her death. Due to Harlow's personal and health problems, 1934 was a lean year for her career-wise. She only appeared in the romantic comedy The Girl from Missouri. The following year, however, was meant to be a return for the blonde bombshell, starring opposite Clark Gable again in the maritime adventure China Seas. The movie was a hit, but her medical issues, lifestyle, and beauty treatments were starting to take a toll on the young starlet. Jean Harlow had never been a picture of health. When she was a child, she had suffered from meningitis, polio, and scarlet fever. As an actress, she was often on very unhealthy diets in order to stay thin, and she had been a heavy drinker for most of her time spent in Los Angeles ever since she came there with her first husband. And then, of course, there were the hair treatments. Publicly, Harlow always maintained that her hair was natural blonde, but it was only after her death that her stylist detailed the extreme procedure she underwent in order to achieve her unique platinum color. She used a special concoction made out of peroxide, Lux brand soap flakes, ammonia, and Clorox bleach. Those last two were particularly bad because combined, they make hydrochloric acid, a strong solution which can be found in the gastric acid inside our stomachs. And Harlow 
they used this substance on her hair once a week. The mixture might have resulted in a unique shade of blonde, but unsurprisingly, it was also extremely dangerous and unhealthy. By the time Harlow began work on China Seas, her hair had already started falling out in clumps, and she was forced to wear a wig for the duration of the filming. Afterwards, she abandoned this beauty treatment and adopted more conventional ways of coloring her hair, but the damage was already done. Despite her failing health, Harlow was pressured to keep working by the studio and by her mother, so she filmed four movies in 1936, always receiving top billing, even over other top Hollywood stars of that era, such as Cary Grant or Spencer Tracy. There was no denying her popularity, but her body simply could not keep up with the demand. In early 1937, Harlow fell ill with what was believed to be, at the time, the flu, but looking back on it, it could have been the early stages of something much more serious. There was not only neglect from the people around her regarding her health, but Harlow's constant drinking could have obscured some symptoms which, if caught early, could have helped save her life. But since time was money, the actress had to get back to work as soon as she was physically able. In March 1937, Jean Harlow began work on what would turn out to be her last movie, another romantic comedy starring opposite Clark Gable, titled Saratoga. However, almost immediately, the platinum blonde was dealing with another health issue and production had to shut down. Harlow had a mouth infection and she needed all of her wisdom teeth removed. To save time, her mother insisted that all four teeth were extracted during the same operation. This was a risky procedure, which even caused Harlow's heart to stop beating briefly during the surgery. Despite all of this, she was not given sufficient time to recuperate, and in April, she was back on set, even though she had to still drain fluid from her mouth and she often dealt with bouts of vomiting and abdominal pain. It was pretty clear that nobody around Harlow cared about her well-being, or at the very least, not as much as they cared about her career. Her body could only take so much, and the predictable happened. Jean Harlow collapsed on set and was taken home. A doctor diagnosed her with an inflamed gallbladder and gave her injections that should have treated the condition. She was expected back on set in early June. When she didn't show up, her co-star Clark Gable paid her a visit at home, and what he saw shocked him. Harlow had bloated to almost twice her size, and she emanated a rotting smell from her mouth. These were both signs that her kidneys were not working properly. Another doctor correctly diagnosed that she was suffering from kidney failure. Unfortunately, neither dialysis or kidney transplants existed back then, so there was nothing they could do to help her. On June the 6th, Jean Harlow was taken to the hospital, where she fell into a coma, and she died the next day just 26 years old. In the decades that followed, a rumor persisted that it was Harlow's extreme hair coloring treatments that caused her death. This has generally been dismissed, and although the exact causes are still undetermined, it is believed that the scarlet fever, which Harlow contracted when she was 15, became the main contributor to her kidney disease. After her death, the studio wanted to reshoot Saratoga with a different actress, but following a public outcry from Harlow's fans, they finished it using a stand-in. This photograph was taken on set shortly before Harlow's collapse, and as it was distributed frequently, following her death, it became the lasting image that the public had of the platinum blonde who took Hollywood by storm. So I really hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks again to Omaze for sponsoring it. Please remember that you can donate and enter for a chance to win a Tesla and some extra stuff as well. There's a link below or just go to amaze.com forward slash biographics and thank you for watching.